snappier title. I'm clearly in need of one. Um, <clears throat> so I have a logical difficulty at the start of the talk, which is that I'm very happy with the general skeptical atmosphere that has prevailed, but a skeptic is meant to be skeptical of the prevailing atmosphere, which means I now have to be skeptical about skepticism. And that's a logical problem, but conveniently, <laughs> <coughs> thank you for the vote of confidence. Conveniently, it's not entirely a practical problem for me because the story I want to tell is partly not, it's not really a skeptical story. Um, and in fact, is about an element of the picture that we don't necessarily pay all that much attention to and in which there is some significant developments that are potentially positive and which are certainly of interest to report. Uh, and that is what is going on in rights-based jurisdiction in some Global South courts. I'm not picking that element because there's nothing else going on in the South, but as you're going to see, there is something I think that's worth talking about in these developments. I'm here talking about this, essentially, I'm here at the conference essentially for two reasons. One is because there is a tendency among rights lawyers to be happy to follow rights into all kinds of areas and to write in very exciting ways about them without necessarily knowing about much about the underlying law of the region. There is quite a lot of human rights writing about company law that is very uninformed by company law. Uh, and so partly I'm here to learn and, and have been learning happily um, for the most of the morning. But the other reason is to talk a little bit more about the southern part of our global picture and about what is going on at the other end of the supply chain. Because there are two reasons why you look at the north, right? The one argument is we look at northern re regulation because it's, these are northern companies or at least there are northern corporate entities involved and northern entities can regulate the balls of money that they incorporate in terms of their own law. And the other version is we look at northern remedies because southern remedies don't work, that we have to look to the north. And I'm certainly not here as an enemy of the northern remedies. Most of the time, they are still the best thing we have. But it's about filling in some more of the picture about what kind of remedies today are available in the south. To start with, something very quickly about the big picture that I want to talk about before I narrow down to corporate law. The big picture is about changes in very recent years in constitutions and rights jurisdictions around the world. Socioeconomic rights are a nice example. There's a tendency to think of these as new, as experimental, as the, something done in a couple of jurisdictions. The average constitution today has socioeconomic rights, as you can see from the figures. <coughs> and this raises the question, what on earth can courts do with these things and with other novel constitutional developments like them? And partly we don't know because of how new this is. And one of the things that is being developed in response is an idea that's going around the global south at the moment, this idea of transformative constitutionalism, that a constitution is a blueprint for the entire society rather than a limited check set of checks and balances, and that it is supposed to be not merely the blueprint, not merely the aspiration, but a means for achieving it. That constitutions, <coughs> and by extension courts enforcing constitutions, are supposed to be agents of social change with responsibilities for the full totality of what things like development or justice could possibly be defined to entail. And courts are acting on, this acting on this invitation to varying degrees. I'm going to talk today particularly about India and Colombia, and I'm talking about them as high points in the trend, as peaks of the graph, but you should think of them both as examples that lots of other courts are following to lesser extents, and about as indicators of where this trend might go in the future. Uh, it's a developing trend and therefore one that's important to take account of. All right, that's enough about the general trend. I want to talk about three quick case studies to illustrate three points um, to suggest some of the things that I'm talking about. This is the Constitutional Court of Colombia, uh, as well as several hundred pigeons, which I couldn't get rid of, um, which is probably the most powerful court created in the post-Cold War world. And the Colombian court... The thing that the particular aspect of it that I want to use it to illustrate is the idea of what Colombian constitutional scholars will call the constitutional regulatory state. The idea, as you'll see from this extract from a decision on water rights, that it's not the case that we have a body of regulatory law, a body of administrative law, a body of company law that happens over here and rights are a kind of external check on bits of this. That instead, the constitution is the starting point and all regulation must serve constitutional ends, 
Therefore, all regulation is subject to constitutional review. Therefore, the Constitutional Court is ultimately in charge of an all things considered decision about what is good regulation. And so the Colombian Constitutional Court acting on this idea has done things like introduce notice and comment procedures into Colombian law. The basis now is a statute, the decree, but it was created by this decision in 2003 on water rights. And it does things that have significant implications for companies, like saying, for instance, that private water companies may not disconnect water from customers who don't pay, uh, who are living in poverty. Right? So this kind of activity is important for corporations in obvious ways like everybody else. It means that if you are a corporation investing in Colombia, your activities are subject to a regulatory jurisdiction that now is heavily controlled by the court. And those of you who know something about the Colombian court will know that it does not shrink away from decisions with extraordinary economic implications. Uh, the best example of this is what happened in the financial crisis in the late 90s when the Colombian Constitutional Court, in a series of decisions, effectively declared the government's home mortgage policy unconstitutional and had the effect of massively driving down the interest rates that you could charge on a home mortgage. Right? It's not only a court decision, other actors were involved, but substantially a court decision with massive implications in the economy. This is not a model, uh, not an idea, that the court will stop using when the economic implications get big. And so this is one reason to think that companies will face this model, just like any other actor. But the lesson that I most want to draw from this is the first one from the Global South right now, and one of interest potentially to the inquiry here, because this kind of thinking has been turned by Global South courts on broad issues of regulation and on whole areas of state activity, but not, as far as I'm aware so much, on corporate law. That there hasn't been much of an effort by courts to rewrite corporate law in a constitutional image in the way that they've done with so many other pieces of law. This tells us it could happen, right? The logic is easy once you've accepted the first premise, but it mostly hasn't. Um, and we could talk about reasons why that's so, which are largely speculative ones, but it's an interesting possible trend for the future. All right, that's case one uh, and a couple of lessons from it. The next case is an even bigger building. This is the Supreme Court of India which would be my candidate for the most powerful court in the world in the last 50 years. Uh, and I suspect most comparative scholars would agree with me on that. What I want to use India to illustrate is something slightly different. Uh, because India doesn't have, in nearly as doctrinally neat a way, the kind of constitutional regulatory state doctrine that we see in Colombia. India is much more a place to illustrate judicial management. Not so much the idea that constitutional jurisdiction will take over everything, but the idea that the court can run things when it thinks it's necessary to do so. And in India, it does this on a truly extraordinary scale. This rather innocent looking bit of paper is the beginning uh, of a court order issued in 2002, creating a device called the Central Empowered Committee, which is going to be very important for the story in a moment. But this is the moment when India's Supreme Court takes control of India's forests. When it says that from then on, the court is going to run forests in India, that it will immediately halt all activities like logging until the court says you may resume them. Um, this is the kind of sweeping intervention that you will see going on in Indian regulation. And then one of the things that enables it to do this is this central empowered committee created by the court in 2002 in that case, and still in existence. And it functions as a mechanism which allows the court to get this body to go and investigate and report and be the basis for the court to make sweeping regulatory orders. This is kind of like an early agency structure in US law. It's kind of like delegating to a board of commissioners, except that under the Supreme Court's model, this committee is answerable to nobody except the Supreme Court uh, and is not answerable to anybody in government, despite the fact that, as you'll see, bits of the government serve on the committee. I uh, will talk a little bit about that relationship in a second. So why does the centrally empowered committee matter to the activities of corporations and in particular to the activities of multinational corporations? Well, let's look at two examples from mining, which is the place where India's model of judicial review has the biggest impact today on corporations. Mm-hmm. 
So here's the first example, which is in a village called Bellary, which is on the easternmost edge of Kanaka. And Bellary is in lots of respects a kind of extremely familiar corporate mining case whose elements you will know. Uh, a company doing things that are potentially illegal, environmental damage, anger from local communities, activity by northern NGOs, all the standard elements. What isn't so standard is the role the court plays in the story because it can get its central empowered committee to go and investigate what is happening in this area. And armed with that report, the Supreme Court of India will stop all the mining in the village for a period of two years, all of it. This is um, a, an iron ore mine which serves a, a broader metallurgical industry. The amount of investment riding on this industry is somewhere north of $50 billion. And the Indian Supreme Court will stop it, flat, because of concerns that the law is not being maintained, that environmental regulation is being broken. This is the sort of accountability that environmental activists dream about, in some ways. Apart from, of course, how hideously blunt it is, we might worry about that, but nevertheless, this is an extraordinary amount of power being exercised by a Global South court. Add to that a second case study, which some of you may know because it has a higher profile um, here in Europe, concerning Vendanta resources listed on the London Stock Exchange. And this is a long and complicated story and it involves other actors. There are two pieces of it that I want to highlight. It's a story about mining applications, it has issues of environmental damage and other things, but it is also a story about an, an indigenous community um, whose ancestral and spiritual land was the subject of the mining license application. The one thing that I want you to see is this rather indignant letter from the Attorney General of India to the Supreme Court of India. And what he's complaining about in that letter is that the company went to the Supreme Court first and the government second. Right? This will tell you everything you need to know about how central the court is, that the company gets clearance from the court and then gets clearance from the Minister of Environment and Forests. But the main thing that I want to draw from this example is what the Supreme Court does in relation to the community concerned. <clears throat> there are competing timekeepers. I think <laughs> we have a jurisdictional fight here. <laughs> so the second thing, the other part that I want you to see from this, the Supreme Court is initially going to insist on the communities signing off on this development. And this decision in 2007 is very important because it introduces uh, free prior and informed consent as a principle into uh, Indian law. But the community signs off in a process that is as dodgy as these processes sometimes are, and the ministry signs off, and the court signs off, and everybody said yes. And Vendanta goes ahead. And the abuses continue, and the promises are not kept. Again, a familiar story. So the pre Supreme Court reopens the process. And it says we're going to consider consent again. And it sends the case to the Gram Shaba, which is the lowest level of Indian government, a village assembly, which is every person in the village over the age of 18. And the village council, unsurprisingly, because the villagers have been unhappy about this for years, says, no, we're not going to allow the mining license to proceed. And the Supreme Court rejects Vendanta's appeal against that decision in, <coughs> in a decision last year. Now, in India, this is usually interpreted in terms of the FPIC principle. But this, to me, and the previous decision, is more interesting because of what it might say about the social license to operate concept. That this is an ongoing process, whereas free prior and informed consent is a once-off process. And this is the idea of the court, not alone with other Indian actors, defining in an ongoing way the conditions under which they are willing to let a corporate entity act in their country. This is the court defining the social license to operate. I'm raising this in particular, because this has a north-south lesson attached to it, that there is a tendency among northern actors to try and separate their processes from southern processes. And it's built from skepticism, that if the Indian authorities sign off and something dodgy and corrupt has gone on, then it needs to be the case that northern standards are separate. Right? And there's perfectly good reasons for that, and, it's sep and, it's, uh, uh, and it is, of course, also legally defensible because we're often talking about a northern entity and a southern subsidiary, and there's different regulatory schemes in play. What this should suggest is the degree to which there could be a very profitable north-south dialogue about what the content is 
of the social license to operate and similar soft law conceptions. Uh, and the UK national contact point, which has been involved in this decision, has missed, in my view, that opportunity. That it adopted that previous keep the processes separate approach to this case uh, and missed what could have been a very interesting moment also for developing Indian law because, of course, the Indian court doesn't operate in terms of social license to operate. It's not a, a concept with a very strong southern presence, even though it has a strong northern one. Third and final case involves a much smaller court, and you should indeed draw conclusions from that. This is a much less powerful, much newer, uh, much less authoritative and established court. But I want to say something briefly about the African regional human rights system for a reason that I hope will be clear in a second. Two decisions which are about the same kind of issue as the Indian case we've just looked at. What kind of permission or rights do indigenous communities have when their government wants to move them off land, in this case to make way for tourist development and ruby mining? And this is a case where, unlike the Indian one, the domestic courts are of no help and the domestic government is not on the community side. I should drop a PS that this is very much, uh, this wouldn't necessarily be true in Kenya today. Kenya is one of the rising courts of interest, and as you know, has just invalidated the results of a presidential election. But this is before the 2010 constitution. And we have two decisions from African regional courts, um, one of which is the first anywhere in the world to be based on the right to development, and one of which is a groundbreaking decision in indigenous rights. Now, the part of the story you're expecting is that these decisions run into implementation problems, and indeed, we know with the Indira decision that it has, the other one is only a few months old and we don't know yet, but the point of raising these is not because this is a magic remedy. The point of raising these is that the presence of an increasing number of judicial remedies like this complicates an important North-South question. Because what it complicates is forum non-convenience arguments. What this makes much harder to do than was true even 10 years ago is to make the argument in northern courts that you need to accept jurisdiction because southern courts are not going to provide an adequate forum. Right? What northern courts want is something like this. This is being quoted by a, a Canadian court um, in Alberta. And they get, to they get to quote Tanzania saying about itself, we are incompetent and our courts are corrupt and mismanaged and so on. Right? This is what northern courts would like because the Southern Court is telling them itself that it can't do this. So the Northern Court there has no trouble exercising jurisdiction on forum non-convenience arguments. And that's been critical, that kind of argument has been critical for mining liability for African violations uh, in a variety of European courts. <coughs> the more we have the African regional system in place, the more we have rising global South courts in general, the harder this is going to be to make. And, of course, talks like the one I'm giving have the moral hazard that they are potentially ammunition for mining companies and other opponents of this sort of litigation to argue that, no, you need to go to the south. That is a concern and a difficult one. Um, and it means that this question of deciding when something should be regulated in the north and when the south is going to get harder and not easier. But the other reason that I want to mention it, and it's the last thing that I want to say, is a piece that's important to understanding this argument. Because the model we've been using for a long time is a tort liability model. We've been talking about the fact that southern lawyers don't have the resources or the experience to bring big tort claims against multinationals. They don't have the pockets to last the litigation out, they don't have the experience. And that is still broadly speaking true. Uh, there are a few exceptions to the rule, but that's broadly speaking true. But the developments that I have been showing you are not based on that. They're all public law remedies based ultimately on rights, not based on private law. And the reason that matters so much is because in many of these jurisdictions, these are systems supported by the courts. The effort of litigation is run by the courts, by things like the Central Empowered Committee and by similar devices, so that litigants do not bear the burden. The ability of a southern litigant to bring a public law case is infinitely greater than the ability of a southern litigant to bring a tort case because they will bear so much less of the burden of litigation. And that means that the old argument for primacy of northern jurisdictions, the old argument for forum non-convenience, is weaker today than it's ever been because poor southern litigants are no longer nearly as much of an obstacle to bringing a southern case. I end on this one because this is the hard problem that we don't have much of an answer to yet that we are used to making arguments for northern remedies based on the assumption that that is all we have. 
Uh, and what I'm trying to illustrate with these case studies is how false that is becoming in some places. It's extremely true in others. It's deeply false in Colombia or India, at least in some areas. Uh, and it's this balance that we're increasingly going to have to strike. I will look forward to your questions about this. Thank you very much. <coughs>